Kisov shoots it to flick it right in. Peter Angelo save rebound. Stastny stopped by Peter Angelo. I don't believe that save. Even if Peter Stastny. He can't believe the save that Peter Angelo just made on him. As Frankie Sparkling on that maneuver there to stop and rob Peter Stastny. He should get 5 to 10 for that. Oh. Hello and welcome to episode 68 of Tendy Talk. Presented by the Hockey Podcast Network and the BLPA Podcast Networks. I'm your host, Joe, better known as Wash Up Goalie on social media. This week, I chat with Steve McKeegan of the Future Pro Goalie School. Steve isn't just an NHL goalie coach who's worked with the likes of former Tendy Talk guests Ed Balfour, but also beer league goalies like other Tendy Talk guests Maria Mountain and my buddy Bonesy. So, without further ado, let's get to the conversation with Steve. Well, Steve, thanks for uh, taking time out of your busy coaching schedule and uh, spending some time with me talking uh, goaltending. Anytime. I love talking goaltending, Joe. I hear yeah. you're uh, big into the uh, the home brewery stuff. Yeah, I, I've uh, done some home brewing. I haven't done much in a while. Uh, I got into it because I like to try different beers. And no sooner did I get into it that a couple really good bottle shops in our area opened up and I'm going... I can brew five gallons of beer and not know how it's going to turn out. And if it's bad, I got to drink five gallons of this stuff. Because what happened is if I had a bad beer, I had to drink it all myself. But if I had a good beer, I was lucky to get one or two bottles because everybody else drank it on me. Right. Um, So I go to these bottle shops and I can build six packs of six different really good beers and try those out. Uh, But it's been a while and I need to brew beer again because it is fun and uh it's a good hobby so you're from minnesota is that with that shirt on are you from minnesota i live in minnesota now but i'm originally from chicago so nice that's where i played my youth and high school hockey young americans and all that uh i didn't play for the young americans i actually played house league hockey growing up because uh mom and dad both worked and we just didn't have the time for travel hockey but then i played my uh high school hockey at brother rice same high school as uh, eddie olchek I know uh, Brother Rice very well. Um, my parents were very similar. Dad was a mechanic, and I wasn't able to play um, anything except house league. Yep. And I played till I was like the equivalent of midget. Yep. And same guys didn't even know what offside was. <laughs> and I still made the NHL, so that was kind of weird that, that you'd play that long. So I guess things worked out in my favor. Yeah, and, you know, I wish house league had a, a you know, greater presence you know in more states because i know like my son probably would have played hockey if house league hockey was an option in minnesota but it's not it's all travel i mean rather than you know have 17 different travel teams for one age level they could like we had in chicago you have one or two teams for every age level and everybody else goes to house league excuse me and we had some really good house league leagues i I heard somebody call it uh, travel house league because we, we basically had three or four associations in a you know, close radius, and we would play those other associations. And, uh, but it, it was better than you know, going all over the state out every weekend. And uh, you know, I, it's, I a mind, it's a mindset issue because it's, it's directly related to parents thinking yep. that their kid's going to play in the NHL. And I always tell people, you want to um, be surprised if your kid makes it instead of disappointed if they don't. Yep. And if you didn't have adults involved, everybody would just play house league and, and play with their buddies like they do out in the pond. Like it would be uh, a lot more equal and people would play for fun because think about it now, you probably love hockey more than you ever have when you're playing as an adult. Cause yep. it doesn't matter. You're not going to get cut. You're just playing for fun. And that's what hockey should be. But you know, too many kids think they disappoint their parents when they don't make it when you're not destined to make it anyways. No. Like it's, People don't understand odds. They have no concept of that. Yeah. Well, as Kane Van Gate says, all roads lead to the beer leagues, even for the pros. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and it, it's really interesting you say that because uh, both my kids signed up for the high school fishing team this year. And we had our conference meeting last night and there was a uh, uh, fishing pro there talking to the kids. And he basically started in saying, hey, if you want to be a pro fisherman or fisherwoman, you know, this is what the road is. It's not easy. It's long hours, you know, it, it becomes a job, not the hobby and everything else. But he, he was really driving home that only a small percentage, even in fishing, make it pro. So 
you know, yeah. he, he basically told all, all the kids sitting there, like, you should go into every tournament expecting to lose. Cause that, that's what life, that's what life really is. The, the winning should be trained to win, but expect to lose. No <laughs> question. Was Kane, great, uh, great I think Kane got his slogan for me. Cause I put an ad out about 15 years ago. It was a picture of a beer bottle uh-huh. and the ad said, well, I'll end up in the beer league sooner or later. Why don't you make it later? <laughs> yeah. And that was, that was the premise for the hockey school. Come to the right. hockey school and then we'll make sure you go to the beer leagues a little bit later than you're planning. Yeah. K- Kane was in uh, Minnesota for the uh, winter classic and he and I got together. I took him to a nice outdoor rink here in Minnesota for a nice little shoot around and uh, f- fun guy to talk to. He's, he's a funny guy for sure. Yeah, he is. So how, how did you get your start in the game of hockey? Not just goaltending, but you know, how did you get uh, turned on to this great game? Uh, I started skating when I was nine. Um, oh, cool. That? Yeah. Piece of shit. <laughs> Couldn't skate. <laughs> Fell down all the time. Kids bullied me, made fun of me for not being able to skate. And they made me be a goalie because I couldn't skate. And then ultimately down the road when I played college hockey for Miami and then played in the NHL, I was one of the best skaters. So it's that initially the shitty kid was put in the net. Yeah. And you know, it's, it, it always amuses me that they, they put the kid that can't skate in the net, or at least they used to. Um, and at the end of the day, the goalies are the best skaters on the ice. Uh, <laughs> I talk about that quite often at the camps because I try to correct some of the mythology related to that. And the goalies have to be the best goalie skater on the team. Mm-hmm. They're definitely not the best skater on the team because if you take Carey Price, who's an elite skater, and you have the Montreal Canadiens go down and back, you know where he'd finish, right? Oh, he's going to finish towards La- last. last. Uh, but- all the out players would, would kill him. And so he's not the best skater on the team. He's the best goalie skater on the team. And that's why I try to explain to people with that mythology that the goalies don't have to be the best skater on the team. They have to be the best goalie skater. That doesn't excuse them Mm -hmm. in practices from not doing crease movements, transitions and hard stuff in their area. But a lot of times coaches fall back to what they learned when they were a kid in the seventies and eighties. And they think the goalie should be skating circles and blue line and back and all that stuff. And I tell them that's not going to hurt the goalie. No, but if you want to become a better putter as a golfer, you don't take slap shots against the barn. They're two slap shots against the barn have nothing to do with putting. Yeah. And it's the same thing with gold, like crossovers and, you know, doing hard stops at the blue line and back. So a lot of coaches, I try to get them out of the seventies or eighties by correcting the mythology with actually intelligence and critical thinking, which yeah. is weird in hockey. It, it, it's funny you mentioned the crossovers. Cause I, I always chuckled, like we, we got these great big pads on and you want yeah. us to have proper crossover technique. Now I right. was the weird goalie who loved skating circles. I, oh, I love doing you know? that stuff. Cause that's all we did. Cause I'm 54. Yeah. So that's all the coaches did. And we didn't know which leg to get up with. And we were doing kick saves and diving poke checks on everything. I was yeah. like Bill Ranford on acid and <laughs> Obviously, I don't teach that, and I teach the modern game. But when we played, we didn't know any better. We didn't have goalie coaches. Yeah. No, I, I was really fortunate when I started playing uh, hockey. Um, there was a fellow by the name of Darren McCluskey who had uh, – he was playing I know for, Darren. Yeah, he, he, was, he got hurt, and he was starting his goalie school in Chicago. And he came to our association and said, hey, if you guys can provide the ice, I'll provide the coaching for your goalies. And so that – that's uh, that was really invaluable to me because I learned, you know, just proper stance and yeah. skate saves. I mean, <laughs> time over time, just going back and forth, making skate saves, two pack stat recovery. In fact, I, I oh, joke yeah. with um, Bones from Nashville that if, if he ever makes up to Minnesota, we'll, we'll get on the ice together and I'll teach him proper recovery in that vintage set of his. Um, yeah, he's because, a good guy. I trained yeah. him a little bit down in Florida. Uh, last year and did a video with him and one of the nicest guys and perfect role player for an e-bug because he's got the right personality and that McCluskey I knew him from when he played junior b in Chatham Maroons in Ontario yeah and then he after he got done playing junior b went out to coach like you're saying there in Chicago yeah Darren is a uh at least when he was coaching me, he, he, he was something else, just, just a character in many ways. Oh, yeah. He played yeah. like that. He played like that too. Like he stirred up a lot of shit on the ice. Yeah. Like if there was a way to get a brawl started, he was, he was the gas on the fire. 
Yeah. And he, he took a liking to me because my dad was a fireman. And uh, apparently when he was a kid, his uh, childhood home burned down when he oh. was at a game, you know, so he, he had a, excuse me, a soft spot for a fireman. Yeah. So we and, all should. Uh, yeah. And so he, I, I don't know if he necessarily gave me extra attention, but uh, yeah, I, I went to his summer goalie school. Yeah. I remember my mom and dad saying, you know, we could send you to a camp for a week, you know, in Minnesota or something, or we can sign you up for Darren's goalie school for the summer, you know, once a week all summer. And it was, to me, that was a no brainer. It was get that training all summer. And then when I go into tryouts, I'm, I'm good to go. And then Smart idea. because of the association, we still had them during the season too, which was really fun. And when I got to high school, my high school coach, our varsity coach, he was a goalie, but older, you know, he came up in the seventies playing and he, <laughs> he didn't necessarily see eye to eye with Darren because he was starting to teach some of the newer techniques coming at the time. This was mid nineties. And, uh, there, there was one, it was state playoffs freshman year and I was just on my game and, varsity coach is sitting next to my dad and he's going man where did he learn to play like that and my dad just kind of smirked and he goes from Darren <laughs> 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 it, it, even my coach you know my coach he's like okay well played well played. Yeah. step <laughs> stepped right into that one yeah ex exactly um but yeah he, he, he was fun and I, I remember when I got to college there was a teammate of mine who had played for Darren and one, once we both knew you know we both had that connection the story you know the st off way stories of his personality just started flowing oh yeah he's a funny <laughs> funny character that kid yeah yeah he he is uh, he's still associated with the game I, I saw somewhere in some association in chicago i saw and i think he owns a junior team in hudson wisconsin of all places <laughs> <laughs> so so you you start playing goalie because like me, you started skating later than most people. Um, you know, not like here in Minnesota or Canada, where it's, you know, as soon as you can walk, you're on the ice. Um, but you were still good. You know, you were an athlete, so you were good. You wind up going and playing college hockey at, uh, what was it, Miami of Ohio, correct? Yeah. yeah. What, what drew you? Was that uh, the only school that came knocking or did, did you have options? What drew you to Miami? So I had actually had lots of options because I'd been playing really well in junior B in Ontario then. And back then, Canadian kids could get scholarships. Mm -hmm. Now there are relatively unicorns for Canadian kids. Like if you look at Minnesota, it's always been Minnesota boys. But yeah. if you look at Boston College, you look at Michigan State, Ohio State, they're 98% Americans now because the prevalence of U.S. USHL North American Hockey League but now it's different back then a lot of the kids in that league got scholarships so I had a choice between going to Harvard Princeton um, there was a smaller one and then there was Miami of Ohio and you can't get a full scholarship to Harvard no nope. uh, it's all financial aid and the same thing for Yale and so I ended up going to Miami of Ohio because it was a full scholarship for four years um, and I, I don't think I was a great athlete I think I had a ridiculous work ethic and a pathological desire to prove people wrong. Like I started a doubter's diary when I was young about all the people that doubted me and said shit about me. And I called each and every one of those ones after I played my first <laughs> game in the NHL. So I was not talented, but I was pathological off the ice, pathological work ethic, like ridiculous. I, I, I love you saying that because I, I didn't have the talent if I'm honest with myself, looking back, I didn't have the talent to play as long as I did, you know, played high school hockey, a lot of kids do that, but I had pretty much everybody, but my mom and dad telling me you'll never play college hockey. Right. Now I played division three JV ho college hockey, but I still played college hockey. And as one of my teammates said, I got put on a Jersey after high school competitively. And a lot of my, actually only exactly. one of, only one of my teammates got to and we played together we we're teammates uh, in college as well everybody else if they played college hockey it was club hockey which club hockey today is a lot different than it was when we were in college you know club yeah. hockey then was um it was glorified beer league yeah <laughs> um and, and so 
the, yeah, I remember pulling that jersey on for the first time and just thinking of all those people that told me that would never happen. Um, you should be proud of that stuff because, yeah. you know, a lot of people apologize for, you know, especially in the coaching business about where they didn't play or they didn't do this. And I go, it has nothing to do with it. You, you go as far as you can. And a perfect example is Mitch Korn, who was my mm-hmm. mentor. And Mitch has got three Vesna winners. He put a bunch of us in the NHL as goalies and about, mm-hmm. I think, five or six of us in the NHL as NHL goalie coaches. And Mitch was a bag of hammers. He was like a 400th goalie for Kent State, four foot 12 piece of shit goalie (laughs) but he was a great goalie coach and so we all have our peaks where we're going to end up and you never need to apologize for what level you play at as a coach because it's you just take it as far as you can and that is what it is well i I forget what i was watching or listening to but it it was laid out really well and it you know guys like ted williams and wayne gretzky they weren't great coaches because everything just came natural to them but guys like me, you, Mitch Korn, we had to start becoming students of the game almost immediately because we didn't have the talent of a Patrick Wah. Exactly. So we had to become students right away. And therefore, by the time our playing days were done, we were, we were already thinking like a coach. We were already yeah. thinking of, you know, other ways to do it, not just how, how can I do it, just what's a better way of doing it. And um, you know, so, some of the best coaches have never played in the NHL. Um, you know, one of my college teammates, Dave Rogalski, he's the New Jersey Devils goalie coach right now. He never played in the NHL. Um, in fact, he, he wasn't even our uh, starter very long at the college level. But <laughs> where did uh, he play? Did he play minor pro somewhere? Uh, no, I don't think so. He, he played at St. Mary's. Uh, at the same time I was there, but I, I don't think he played anywhere after, but he, is he the head goalie coach for New Jersey? Yeah, he is. Um, but it, it, that was an interesting one because it had him, a fellow by the name of uh, Ryan S who runs seven air goaltending here in the twin cities, we just had all of these goalies that I, I think we all knew we weren't going to go much further. And so we were already thinking about, you know, how, how can we get that little extra edge in our game? And, and there wasn't any, um, jealousy with the other goalies you know so you know ryan was playing more than me and dave great you know what can we see in his game and then when we were on the ice in practice we were watching each other and seeing little bits in each other's game saying hey i noticed this um or i see you doing that how are you doing that because it's funny i say it but that was right around the time where kind of that butterfly shuffle was coming out where you know the the overdrive blade was on uh, some skates and so it was like how, how are you sliding like that that that's pretty cool how are you doing that and you know we worked together and you don't always see that with a lot of goalies at that age level anyway yeah and you see it a lot when you get into goalie coaching too there's mm-hmm. a lot of guys that think they have the secret sauce and yeah they got they got their special buzzwords and they only want their kids working with them and I'm the opposite I think kids should work with a lot of goalie coaches because here's the reality if you are going to go ahead in hockey, you're not going to have your guy the whole way. Mm-hmm. Like when you get to college, you got a different goalie coach. Yeah. When you get to minor pros, you got a different goalie coach. And if you're stuck in the woods thinking, you know, I'm only going to listen to my guy, you're going to limit how far you go in hockey. And so I think the best coaches want their kids to learn from as many people as possible and mm-hmm. have a good critical filter because like one goalie coach might teach you five things and you have enough discernment to know, 95% of what he's teaching you isn't going to help, but the 5% could help you. Mm-hmm. And so at the end of the day, I think it's important that a lot of goalies learn from different goalie coaches and have an open mind and that goalie coaches stop being possessive of their guys because they're not your guys. Yeah. They're, it, you just have them for a period of time. It, it, that was one thing I liked about Darren. And even, you know, at a young age, it, it rung true to me. He goes, I'm not going to teach you how to play like your favorite NHL goaltender. He goes, first of all, you can't, what they do is wrong, but they have the talent to do that, you know, because yeah. that was in the days of Felix Potvin with his glove like this, and yeah. Eddie, Eddie Belfour with his giant five hole. And, you know, they were doing things we would never teach. He goes, they can do it because they have the talent. He goes, I'm going to look at you and see what's best for you. So the way he coached me was different than the way he coached my buddy. Uh, it, it was and when I was coaching in high school, that, that's what I tried to do too, is, okay, let me look at the kid. Let me see, A, what's his personality? Because each, each kid responds differently. Right. And then once I figure that out, 
what's his style? And then let me yeah. work with that style and help him get better with that. I'm, I'm not going to try and change him. One of my goalies uh, religiously went to Rob Stauber's camps here in the Twin Cities. So, you know, rather than try and change completely the way he was thinking from those camps, it was, okay, what are you guys working on there so that I can work with that and build upon that? Not just, well, Rob's wrong. Don't do that. Uh, yeah. and, you get, and you do get that a lot. And it's funny you mentioned Eddie because I trained Eddie for five years. And yeah. um, when he came to me, I, I sat down and talked to him because I also idolized Trechiak. And I said, well, he was your first goalie coach in the NHL with the Blackhawks. And I said, well, what did you do with Trechiak? And he goes, well, Trechiak could hardly speak English. So they yeah. never did any technical things. So he didn't know which leg to get up with. Um, or anything technical from a biomechanic, but Trechek was a great coach for being supportive in big picture things. Mm -hmm. And Belfort always talked about that. So when I started working with Eddie, that was back during the VH days where they were just coming in and yeah. he, with our first private lesson, he didn't know which leg to get up with, which was kind of funny, <laughs> but he was a quick learner. And one of those guys that anything that could help him win more games, that's all he cared about. I, I was going to say, I wanted to ask about him because a, I mean, that was the goalie I grew up idolizing. I mean, I, I was a young goalie in the early to mid nineties and how do you not like Eddie Belfour in that? Um, and I, I've been lucky enough to have him on the podcast, uh, which was interesting. Cause you know, I had a few people, Oh, you know, you, you don't want to meet your heroes. They'll disappoint you. And Eddie couldn't have been anything, but awesome. he's a sweet, he's a sweetheart. And I think oh, it's yeah. a misnomer misnomer for people because yep. they know the stories about him. And exactly. He's the most competitive yeah, you'll ever meet. And here's a perfect example of that. So when we first were training, it was during an elite camp. So there was like 14 year old kids, 15 year olds, and he wanted to join the summer camp. And when he called and left a message, he said, I just want to know, do you let adults into the camp? And he didn't say what his name was. And I said, well, the camp's full. And he goes, called me back. And he says, well, I was hoping you'd let me in. And then he dropped his name. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I've been talking to Ed Belfort. Yeah, I'll, I'll find a way to get you in the camp. <laughs> So we're doing a 45 minute run behind the rink and he had to win no matter what. <laughs> and so right at the very end, he caught this kid from Boston named Michael McCarthy at the end of the 45 minute run, he came over and he puked on my shoes near the ground, right beside me, a puke coming out of his mouth. And he said, that kid will never beat me. And I think that sums up competitiveness because it's how hard you work when you don't have to. Mm -hmm. It's how hard you work when nobody's watching. And at that point he'd already had hall of fame credentials. So he wasn't doing it to prove anything. It was, he had to win. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's a testament to Belfour is that it didn't matter if it helped him win. That's what he added. If it didn't help him win, he discarded it. Well, and it, it's funny because now he's in the whiskey business with his son and, and he still has that mentality. We were talking about that when I had the two of them on the podcast and it's, you know, he wants to be the best at whatever he's doing. And now their whiskey is winning all these awards, you know, even though it's a young whiskey brand, it's like, I don't care what I'm doing. I want to be the best. And uh, I, I got to go back and listen to the episode. I think he may have actually told that story of running with some kids and had to beat them. <laughs> yeah. He's uh, uh, he's a funny character. Like the thing with his gear too was, was very interesting because it's interesting with an athlete when, how you attribute a uh, failure. So for instance, suppose a guy comes down the wing, and goes far side pad and you don't get stick involvement and you put it off your shin in the slot and the guy scores the corrective thing is to in practice work on getting stick involvement not letting mm -hmm. it hit your pad but for him when you talk about it in the dressing room after the next morning he'd say well my pad sucks and um the vertical rolls need to be hc 75 density 65 foam and he'd get rid of the pads and get a new set of pads. So outwardly, he would blame the gear. But then that day in practice, we would go work on that exact thing. And he'd make the physical correction. So outwardly, he'd blame the gear. But he was intuitive and intelligent enough to know there's a structural thing he needs to do differently on that situation. And I love that about him is he, he wouldn't blame it on the gear and just ignore the problem. Mm -hmm. He would blame it on the gear and fix the problem. You know, I, I wanted to ask about his time with you because, you know, as you mentioned, he had already had those Hall of Fame credentials. It was on the back end of his career and he had already changed his game quite a bit. You know, you look at pictures of his stance when he's in Chicago and he's got that great big five hole, you know, the, the Eddie Belfort stance we know. Of. In fact, 
you know, we, we talked about my home brewing. I kind of created a logo for it. It's called Five Hole Brewing. And I use that silhouette of him from the, yeah, the iconic. 90s. It's iconic. But when you look at him when he was in Toronto with you, it was a very different stance. It was a lot more compact, you know, more upright. You know, he, there's the saying you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but he he proved that wrong. You know, how receptive was he to, you know, new things and evolving technique. A couple of things about that. Number one, when we started off, he asked me if I'd be his goalie coach. And, and I said, I will, but we're equals. I'm mm -hmm. not going to, you're not going to talk down to me and vice versa. And the first time you lose your cool with me, I'm done. Cause I, I got a couple of mil in the bank. I don't need to be doing this. And we were equals. And he never said a crossword to me in five years. So by starting off on that basis, that helps. Second thing, um, related to his stance, it was a hundred percent because it was his messed up back. Mm -hmm. So he was, he's had originally in one of the playoff rounds against Philly got scored on through his armpit by Ronick. And he knew he had to change the lie on his stick and how he was um, positioning himself in the butterfly because he couldn't be bent over like he used to be. So his upper body was a lot more upright. We played with the stick. So he still had good five hole coverage, but he would, he would make changes like that. If you put it to him to understand why you're doing it. And he, he was probably one of my best students because he was doing it for the right reasons. He knew it was going to help him. And if it helped him, he would add it in. I, I was also wondering, you know, a guy like that, you know, you're the coach, he's the student, but you know, as you said, you guys are equals. What did you learn from him in that? I learned more. I learned more from him than I helped him hundred <laughs> percent. And the first thing that we touched on earlier was the competitiveness and the reason why he was a hall of famer was because of that, but also his skill at handling the puck. Um, he was very smart. Part of the rule change was because of Brodeur and him mm -hmm. and some other people, but predominantly him, because whenever you try to forecheck Belfort, the D would just go to the corners and you're and he would, you know, you try to put two guys in on a forecheck. How, how do you get the puck from him? Cause he would give it to D one or D two, or he'd catch the center curling. And so that's the reason they put the trapezoid in was because of him and Brodeur. So the best thing I would learn is how simple, safe and maintaining possession he was when he handled the puck. And also just his ability to read the play at the end of his career, he had the movement skills of you and I right now, mm -hmm. he couldn't move to save his life, but he could smell what the rocks cooking. So when the puck was moving here, here, and that would go to this guy, he would already know the guy's a right-hander. He would already know the quality of his defensive personnel. And so he could read the play and be arrived there in time and make a simple save in his chest. And I think that's the biggest weakness to Instagram bully coaches <laughs> is there's all these cool, bright, shiny objects like VR goggles and stupid shit. And that's not what stops pucks. It's the ability to read the play. Yep. It has nothing to do with juggling has nothing to do with look at this cool drill on Instagram where the coach floats it in and I put my nose over the puck or whatever the latest buzzwords are. That's not going to get you where you want to go. It's the stuff I learned from Eddie was reading the play above all is what allows you to play at the higher levels. Nothing to do with ability. Zero. Yeah. And you know, you, you talk about those training, it's probably the best training aid out there is probably that sense arena where you're doing just that you're reading plays that are it, happening in front of you, you know, more real time than anything else we can get off ice. It's, it's probably okay. in that thing, if you can't get ice time, but I've got a hundred sheets of ice within one hour where I am. And yeah. the, the only issue I have with the VR training is this at the highest levels on 10 pucks, 10, per, you know, one out of 10 pucks gives you time to react to the flight of the puck. Anything shot on an NHL goalie below the top of the circles, there's no reaction time. Mm -hmm. You're filling that box making a block save and it may look reactionary, but the problem with VR goggles is they work on the reactionary saves, which is 10% of your job. Yep. The 90% is movement positioning and reading the play. And the, the issue is if you have a kid that likes to do bright, shiny objects and play with video game stuff, but they can't lift the puck on their backhand to save their life. You're going to have a shitty puck handler. That's good at playing a video game. <laughs> that's not somebody that's going to get a full scholarship to Minnesota. Right. And those, I always believe it. it's a cool thing. There's, but the thing with the VR goggles is there's no empirical evidence or peer reviewed study. It works. It's sort of like, well, Joe says it works and it seems cool. So is that how you're going to predicate your growth in hockey? A guy's thinking it works, or do you want to actually see physical studies that prove it works? I would rather see guys work on movement and the hard stuff instead of the fun 
stuff that kids love to do. That's yeah. not going to get you where you want to go. Well, and like you said, reading plays, you know, whenever I buy tickets to an NHL game or even a AHL game, I always try and go higher up because yeah. I want to see the plays. I want to understand what's happening. And my dad never really got it. He, he liked the idea of sitting down low, being close to the action, which we've done that a few times. In fact, uh, when I was in high school, I had tickets for three games in a row at the United Center, right above the Zamboni entrance behind the visiting goaltender. And I saw in successive games, Patrick Waugh, Roberto Luongo, and Grant Fear play. I was like, so I was really happy to be right down behind them. But I love sitting up high, watching those plays develop and see what's going on around away from the play. And the one, one game, my dad's sitting there, he goes, what are you watching? Because I I know you're seeing something completely different than me. And I started explaining it to him. He's like, I had no idea that was going on. I'm just watching the puck. It's like, no, you know, and it, it was almost like Tony Romo calling a football game where he's calling the play before the snap. And right. I was telling my dad, it's like, watch, he doesn't have an outlet there. He's going to go over there. And he's like, I never saw the game that way. <laughs> it's, it's intelligent anticipation. And I just, one of the, the last video that just came out of my YouTube channel, Future Pro Goalie School, um, <laughs> was about telling people to stop watching hockey. And it's like, I'll tell the kids that. And they're like, what are you talking about? I said, I haven't watched a hockey game in 25 years. I critically study it for cause and effect. And with my elite athletes, we get into stuff like, okay, you know, there's a guy open on the back door. Do you know what hand he is? Mm -hmm. Do you know who he is? Because like when you're playing at the highest level, there's a big difference between Sidney Crosby being there or Ryan Reeves. Yeah. And if you don't know what hand is before he gets it, you're pushing over generally belly button to belly button, and you're going to be squared up to his body, not to the stick, unless you know in advance what hand the guy is. So the biggest thing you can teach a young athlete, anybody can teach technique and get up with this leg and all the technical stuff, but teaching people to actually read the play properly I can uh, help your listeners by sending them a script. There's like 15 questions you ask every time you watch a scoring chance. Yeah. Is it a line rush? Is it a zone entry? Is it a setup? Is there back pressure, power play, PK? What's the game situation? What's the goalie's depth? Was he lined up on the puck or the body? And so when you start breaking the game down in a more analytical way, you get a lot more growth in your game as a goalie than just watching it going, hey, great save, UC Saros. That's a great save. Like, yeah. You have to have some critical thinking to play yep. at higher levels skills don't get you there critical thinking does well it, it goes back to something uh, it, you know back to darren mccluskey you know when he goes i don't want to see you guys make those big saves because it means you are out of position and right. you know so that, that's always been something that stuck with me is when, when i see the big save when i'm watching the replay i'm going how did he get out of position yeah why, why did he have to make that desperation save where where was the mistake in the first place and you know that that was I think when I really had the appreciation for a goalie like Patrick Waugh who to a lot of people was kind of a boring goalie to watch because he was always in position yeah. and yeah when you realize what he's doing you know to to your point of watching him and being analytical and understanding what he's doing versus oh he just made a simple you know butterfly glove save well, no, he read the play, came over perfectly and made it look simple. Um, you know, it, and the thing with um, with the reading, the play and understanding that it's 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 not something that comes natural to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And it's it's hard for somebody to teach it if they don't understand it. And I think that's one weakness, because in the industry of goalie coaching, anybody can go online and watch a YouTube video about, hey, look at this cool drill and then just do 30 drills with a kid. Yeah. And they think that, you know, it's like going to a driving range. If you ever golfed, you're, you can do great things on the driving range, but to actually bring that out and deploy it um, in, a, in a pressure of a match is, is a lot different animal there for sure. You know, it, and it's funny too, because having played at the level I did and understanding how plays are supposed to happen. And then I come to the beer league and I'm anticipating things happening and they don't happen because, I mean, some of these guys never played organized hockey. Yeah, could be hard, uh, could be easy. You don't yeah, know. Yeah, it's like, oh, my, you know, where th there's been times where I'm completely out of position and it's an easy goal. And it's, you know, my teammates are going, how did that happen? I'm going, because I anticipated the play as it was supposed to happen, not the yeah. five broken plays that happened as a result of, you know, this or that. And that that's probably been the biggest adjustment I've had to make in the beer leagues is learning to anticipate a different game, not the one right. I grew up with. 
Right. Uh, <laughs> and you're talking about the, uh, the flashy saves. And I always, you know, a scout in the NHL. And when you see a kid at a certain level that's relying on flashy saves, um, you know, from time to time in chaos, you're going to need the flashy save. And it, you yep. want that in the toolbox, but they can't be your default or your go-to. Because if you're a flashy goalie at a certain level, as an NHL scout, we look ahead and say, well, when we project out the speed to increase the quality of play to increase. If you're just elbows and assholes making saves right now, when the play gets better, that's going to be a goal. Yep. So a boring positional goalies at a certain level extrapolate to likely be good pros down the road. If you can be controlled at a certain level, you can carry that game to the next level. Now, it, the only flashy save I, I like to pull out of my toolbox is it's always calculated. And it's when either the passes across ice to my glove side and the guys down here or it's a breakaway where the guy's cutting down from my glove side and coming across and I stack those pads and get that stick out there the 20 it, foot pylon yeah and it's like they're either going to crash over me and lose the puck and it's coming into me or they're going to panic because they're not used to seeing two pads and, and, fu- and fumble it yeah they'll, they'll just slide right into you because they're like what the hell it works every single time. And it, it's funny because then the guys come up, oh man, that was awesome. It, you know, nice save. And it's like, it, it's kind of the uh, Dominic Hoshik mentality when you used to go paddle down and everything was in close before like, what's he doing? He's like, well, they're in so close. They can't get the puck over me. It's like, do, do something fun and flashy because hey, at the end of the day, it is the beer league. So let's have a little it's, bit it's of fun. fun. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, I've told the story on the podcast before I, I was, uh, early to a game in the summertime and there was a high school team out there and only one of their goalies showed up and they were just getting on the ice as I was walking in the rink and their coach was like hey if you want some extra shots to get warmed up for your game come on out so I did I was like one, one stipulation I'm not skating wind sprints at the end and he started yeah. laughing he goes I wouldn't expect you to um, <laughs> but they're scrimmaging and there's one of those passes and I stacked the pads and the rebound falls right in front of this kid and he could have easily grabbed it and put it up over me, but he just stopped. And he looks at his coach. He goes, what do I do to that? I've, like, I've never seen that. And I, I just looked at the kid. I said, you play till the whistle, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> like, don't, don't stop. But it was just funny that these kids have, you know, at, at their level have never seen the, those old saves. It was kind of fun to pull out. And it's like, yeah, I always chuckle too when I watch like the Pavel Barber bullshit. Yeah. And, and the reason I laugh is because if you have a goalie from our generation, that's not telegraphing it, but smart, violent poke checks yeah that little three foot area in front of you nobody would ever bring a puck in there and so when you watch pavel barber come in and do his goofy shit it's always on a a stunt goalie that's not really trying yeah i would love to see pavel do 10 breakaways on bill ranford and see how that ends yeah and he he would be doing his pick the puck up crap and he'd be on his back it wouldn't go in but you mentioned hasek i played against hasek five years or five times when we were in the IHL, he was playing for um, Indianapolis Ice yep. before Chicago brought him up. And we would think, watch him in warm up, he's a bag of hammers. He's going to give up a million goals and he would beat us two to one or one nothing. But I saw him do two things I guarantee you've never seen before. I guarantee it in all your life and everything you know about hockey, you've never seen these two things, Joe. He, he picked the puck up with his blocker, which you've seen. Yeah. You've seen that part. But he stood up while the play was on. And he one bounced it on the ice and he drop kicked it to center ice during a minor pro game. <laughs> and I also saw him because it was against me. I saw him pick it up with his blocker, throw it about two feet in the air, turn the face of his blocker over and just whack it out to the center ice. And all of the guys on Milwaukee admirals at the time were looking at each other going, what the f- are we seeing here? Like, is he making fun of us? Like you think about that, you pick a puck up and yeah. the game's still going and he one bounces it off the ice and drop kicks it in the center. Are you shitting me? That was Hassan. <laughs> yeah. And we'd lose two nothing. And people are like, how do we let that guy beat us? <laughs> Just Dom being Dom, right? Dom being Dom. <laughs> Face yeah. down in the ice, looking out the corner of his helmet out. You kick his leg yeah. up. It always had a smile on his face too. The whole oh, time. Yeah. It's like, it, you know, you, you see him without his equipment on and he's just a string bean. It, like, you look at him, it's like, you should not have been one of the greatest goalies ever play the game looking like that, but he, he, I laugh. He, he had the mindset. I laugh when people say, Oh, he was lucky and whatever. Like these are the best shooters in the world yeah. you, in the NHL. You aren't lucky if you do that for 12 years, that's right. not luck. 
and have the best save percentage in a generation by a long shot. That's not luck. There's something else going. Can't teach it. No. But to say he's lucky is really a disservice to his his just ability to not quit on pucks. And Mitch Corn had him in mm-hmm. Buffalo, and, and they got a Vesna together. And the thing he always used to tell me about Hasek was in practice, you couldn't score. And it was so rare for them to score on him in practice. Guys would literally celebrate when they would score. And I saw that firsthand at a morning skate. I brought some kids in Nashville to watch um, Hasek play. And all morning skate, three on O's, two on O's, no defense. And finally, at the end of practice, Lindy Ruff, the coach, scored. And the team celebrated like they won the Stanley Cup. And, <laughs> and Hasek was like, try that again. Like, it was funny because how rare to all your listeners is it that you could go a whole practice and they don't score on you the whole practice. That's yeah. why the game games to him were easy. Yep. Yeah. I, you know, and I, I remember the stories, you know, when he was playing of, yeah, he, he doesn't like to let up a goal in practice or, and, nope. and then, then you'd watch him in warmups and you'd see he's like that in warmups. And then you try doing it and practice yourself and like 10 shots in, there's already three You're pucks dead. in the net. You're, You're dead, like, yeah. no, that's not possible. It's like, yeah. So Mitch, Mitch, uh, when he had me in college, he did save percentage on us on every practice the whole time I went to college hockey on a DOS spreadsheet. Oh, wow. And Mitch is one of the first ones to start that. And that's some good advice for your younger listeners. Um, once in a while, I'll have somebody that's not related to you because stats from your parents are horse shit. Yeah. Um, have somebody calculate what your save percentage is in practice once in a while, just to see if there's any growth in that. And at college at Miami, they'd list us full scholarship guy, half scholarship and walk on. And if me being the full scholarship guy, didn't have the best save percentage in practice, they call me up to the office to give me shit. And <laughs> I, I, I solved the problem. You know what I did? They had these three really unattractive human beings <laughs> keeping the stats. Yeah. I found out which girl was doing mine all the time took her out for a couple of dates and I always got 95 <laughs> in practice. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's anticipating again, That's anticipating right. just, the play. I'm, pl- I'm playing the game. I'm just reading, the, I'm reading and reacting. I'm intelligently anticipating. Yeah. Uh, her name was Anne-Marie. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, so I, I had a few other notes here I want to get to. So you're, you're playing, you know, in the minor leagues, you spend two full seasons, you get the call up to Vancouver, you get your game, you know, very much like uh, um, Moonlight Graham and Field of the Dreams, you get your cup of coffee, um, you, you get that game against New Jersey, but then you get hurt. Uh, what happened that led to the injury? Because it was in a game, correct? Yeah. So in advance of that, because I get this from the kids all the time, they'll say, oh, you only played one game in the NHL, you must have sucked. At the time I got hurt in the minors, Hasek and I were neck and neck on every category, and the Hockey News had ranked him and me the two best prospects in all the minors, according to the Hockey News. So I had been ripping it up one step out of the NHL, so it wasn't a bag of hammers. Yeah. Uh, Kirk McLean or Troy Gamble or somebody got hurt, so I got my game in the NHL, which proved a lot of people wrong. And when you play a regular season game in the NHL, that closes a lot of people's mouths. And the next game I'm playing in Peoria – Uh, because I was up and down between the minors and the NHL, and there's a fight in front of my net, and uh, a goofball named Tony Twist. um, (laughs) He was 240 pounds, 5% body fat. He'd hardened up his knuckles over the years on his floor. Yeah. Um, So both his hands were calcified. Um, He knocked out five guys that year in the minors through their helmets with punches. Like he punched the guy with the helmet on and knocked him out. So he's a meathead. He's beating the crap out of one of my college defensemen from Vermont named Carl Valamont. And I break up the fight because I played left the zone and twist was pissed that I broke up his fight. So two periods go by, there's a neutral zone face off and twist gets a second shift of the game. Cause he's a piece of shit. Never played. He only plays when he was fighting and he comes up to my winger, dumb, dumb DeBoer who coaches in the NHL now PD DeBoer. And he goes, I'm going to run your effing goalie. And Dum Dum goes, no, you're not. So Petey hooked him up, put the stick in his gut and rode him around the ice. Uh, goalie at the other end was Guy Hebert, um for Peoria. Puck gets dumped in from center ice into the upper deck behind my net. Plays whistle dead. So Pete drops the stick on him because the play's dead. And Twist starts accelerating from outside the blue line when the play's dead. I got my back towards center, just to the side of the net, looking in the upper deck, watching the guy get hit in the face with it. 
and Twist checked me from behind during a stoppage of play. I went from the goal line head first into the boards. I was unconscious before I hit the boards. I detached both my retinas, dislocated my um, cervical vertebrae, was paralyzed, was in a hospital with a halo on thing screwed in my head and a little mirror on an angle like this. I woke up in the hospital and when you get knocked out, no time passes. It was just, I am playing the game next, you know, like, what am I doing here? Can't feel my body. Yeah. I was unconscious on the ice for 30 minutes and they brought this, the uh, ambulance out on the ice. Um, Twist came up into the hospital after while I'm in there. And he said, my general manager made me come. I meant to hurt you, but I didn't mean to hurt you this bad. And that's the end of my NHL career. It, it, when, that's when, it. You, when you hear the story, it, it makes you wonder how his career wasn't ended at that point. If that happens today, he's blackballed. Right. He doesn't he play. Three-game three suspension. Yeah, and, and he goes on and has an NHL career after that. It, it you know what? I always look at it optimistically. I got my game in the NHL. Like if I would yeah. have had it happen when I didn't get the game in the NHL, then everybody, I'd be telling everybody like the beer league dress. Oh, I could play in the NHL. Okay, sure you could. Yeah. But once you play in the regular season, you people say whatever you want. I made yeah. it to the NHL, but karma came and bit him in the ass because mm -hmm. at one point he wasn't going to be resigned by St. Louis blues. And um, he left the St. Louis blues arena in a huff on his motorcycle and um, he caught his leg. He had a big accident because he was driving like an idiot. He was all upset on a uh, fire hydrant, had a wishbone fracture in his pelvis, almost died. He's in the hospital and his girlfriend comes in to check on him and his wife comes in to check on him. <laughs> so his hockey career is over. No contract money from St. Louis Blues. His wife finds out he's got a girlfriend. You can imagine how much that cost him. Yeah. And so at the end of the day, karma came for him eventually yeah <laughs> and it was on a it was on a fire hydrant yeah so i haven't lost any sleep over it <laughs> uh geez uh, as a hawks fan i was never a fan of tony twist myself i love uh, tough guys but uh, yeah, here's what i said if he had a hard on against me you know what he should have done turned me around looked yeah. me up in the face and beat the living crap out of me because i'd have a caved in face but i'd be able to play the next night well, I, but what he did took away my career like he's, he's a tough guy he doesn't yeah. need to do a cheap shot he could beat the crap out of me and i take it that's part of hockey not what I, he did though i've argued for years that there's there's a place in the game for the tough guys um but guys like john scott guys like bob guys that you know hey th this is what's going down um you know th they're not going to make you know the cheap shot it's it's going to be face to face um, yeah, which is fine. And I, I love those guys. My best teammates with Vancouver, like Gino Ogic, Craig Cox, yeah. um, Sean Antoski. There's some tough guys that played us. And I love those guys because yeah. they were heads up. They would fight you face to face and they protect you. They don't do cheap shots. 90% of the time, those, those tough guys are the nicest guys off the ice and probably the most guys. ethical guys off the ice too. <laughs> I remember Gino, Gino Ogic was a, a funny guy who played for the Canucks. He would always protect the Burray, Pavel Burray. And and Gino um, went into the training room one day because he had a cold. And the trainer said, what do you need? He goes, I need some A535. And we watched Gino eat the whole tube in front of us. And we're like, what are you doing? He goes, it warms me up on the inside. And I'm like, Gino, like, is there anything else you do? He goes, well, when I was a kid growing up on the reserve, my mom used to put a rag soaked in gasoline in the crib to help me sleep better at night. <laughs> <laughs> it's all starting to add up now. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Hope they weren't smokers. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I always tell the story, you know, like when we were kids, I grew up Irish Catholic. When we were kids, if we were sick, you know, you get the shot of whiskey before yeah. bed. And, you know, sleepy my, time. My, my dad always said, it's not going to help you feel better, but it's going to help you get a good night's sleep, which is just as good, you know? Whiskey fixes everything. Yeah. And it's <laughs> like, now maybe that's why I don't like whiskey today. Except. Except for Belfour's whiskey. After I had him on the podcast, he sent me some of his new stuff, and I can drink that. Most whiskeys, yeah. though, to me is like rocket fuel, but that, something about that, it's a little bit smoother. I, I, I like it. Um, but I, I want to be mindful of the time, and I, I don't know if you've listened to any of the other episodes, but I like to end every episode with a list of 10 questions. I, I used to call them rapid-fire questions, but they're not always rapid because of the stories that come out of them. But they're the same questions I've asked every single guest, which... I think is the fun part. And I've actually started going back and writing down what the answers were for, 
some uh, lists. But the first one is, what's the craziest coaching moment from your playing days? Um, I think the craziest coaching moment is we were playing in the minors one time and um, one of the guys on the other team scored. I think a, a Sasha Lakovic it was, or Darren Banks or something. He came over to our bench and they got down on all fours, pretend like they were pissing out a fire hydrant, which was our bench. And our coach said, let's go boys. And they're like, all of us went out and fought. So he just, as soon as he saw that guy pissing on a fire hydrant in front of our bench, our head coach, uh, I think it was Dave Allison, just sent us all out. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So what is your favorite all-time goalie mask? Uh, it would have to be the the Belfour mask that's got the, the word eagle in the feathers. Yeah. Which a lot of people don't realize is latest. Like the one he had in Toronto, it spells the word eagle in the feathers. So I always loved Eddie's mask. It's most iconic and the guy that makes him Harrison, uh, he made me my first mask in the NHL, Greg Harrison. And he's oh, cool. sort of the originator of the cage mask combo. Yeah, he he painted Eddie's original um, eagle. And then yeah. that one you're talking about, uh, Todd Miska painted, who yeah. lives 20 minutes from me. I, I actually had the pleasure of interviewing him for an Ingle Magazine article, gosh, 15 plus years ago. And uh, Todd's son is now in the Colorado organization. Nice. And um, last year when he was playing for the Eagles, he had the Eagle, the Belfort Eagle. And uh, I, I said, if there's going to be anybody wearing that mask in pro hockey, he's the guy. He, he's the only one that can do it because his dad was the one that created it and painted it. And uh, his dad also painted Manny Fernandez's uh, Minnesota Wild Mask. So that's that's what he has this year for the Eagles, you know, but in Colorado colors. So it's kind of cool that he's got his dad painting, you know, some of his old iconic designs I, for him. I, something just came to mind. I have to mention before I forget my, my backup goalie in Milwaukee was Bob Mason uh, and Mace would always have hand lotion. Uh -huh. And every time he came off the ice, he was always getting his hands all lotioned <laughs> up. And we always they were like, Mace, what are you doing? And so it was, he had the softest hands. Most I said, Mace, you're a hand model or an NHL goalie, but he's done a good job coaching the goalies in Minnesota. Yeah, he. Uh, it's funny you mentioned that because one of the uh, guys had on the podcast, Connor uh, Beaupre, Don Beaupre's son, he's their e-bug and does a lot of uh, morning skates with the team. And so he, he's worked with them. And when Connor and I were talking, he mentioned how much he likes <laughs> working with them. Um, so the, the next question, what's your favorite rink that you've played at? The first rink I ever skated on in Strathroy, Ontario, when I first put skates on. You know, it's funny, most of the goalies I talk to, you know, so, some have played at some of the, you know, the best arenas in the world. And it's usually that first rink they start skating in because there's, yeah. there's just where it all started. Uh, yeah. It, it, for me, it's the same thing. The Southwest Ice Arena in Crestwood, Illinois, a uh, great little barn that had a bar. You can over smell it. The you ice. Can, yeah. You, you remember what it smells like. You remember what it looks like. It's just that, that smell of the old rinks where you could smell the Zamboni and people yep. were allowed to smoke in the rink back then. Like it, that that smell brings me back to me at nine years old again. Yeah, I, I can close my eyes. Like you said, the, the mixture of cigarettes and the uh, concession stand out in the lobby, and popcorn then, and the zamboni. Yeah, yeah and th then you get, there were four locker rooms, and it was like each one had its own distinct smell. Yeah, and uh, it wasn't good. Wasn't good. No, no, it yeah. wasn't. I mean, it, it was an old rink even when I played in it, and it's still around. So I can't imagine it smells much better these days. Um, so what is your favorite stick that you've ever used? I used to use the old Louisville straight because I uh, had uh, I had to shoot left-handed and right-handed because I was naturally a righty and I used to do the turnover like Cujo, but Mitch yeah. Korn made me learn to shoot left-handed. So I used a straight Louisville Lie 13 square heel. My, my first stick was a straight blade. And uh, that when I used to play the old style, that was probably the best I ever played the puck. Now, now I use the Tur Turco grip and I can... Yeah. I've never been great at playing the puck, but I can do it a little bit better. And it's funny. And uh, my last game, I came out to the, the ref waved off an obvious icing one referee system. It, it's going to happen. And so I had to come out to play the puck and there's these two guys coming down and my teammates, even though I'm yelling, no ice, no ice, they just stopped skating. So I'm like, okay, what do I got to do? And they're like, well, we thought you were going to pass it up to us. <laughs> I, I ended up pulling a, uh, Aaron Dell and kind of checking the guy that came down, just not as fierce, you know, and kind of 
and then time ran out, but they're like, well, we thought you'd play it up to us. It's like, we've been playing together. How long? You know, I cannot play the puck, especially with two opposing players between me right. and you. I'm not putting the puck in play. <laughs> and they yeah. started laughing. They're like, fair enough. Fair enough. Lesson uh, learned. Yeah. Uh, but it, we all got a laugh out of it. That's for sure. Uh, so what's your favorite youth hockey memory? Um, let me shut this off here. <laughs> um, it would probably be winning a silver stick against Grimsby, the North American silver stick, and they had a goalie yeah. on the other team named Curtis Joseph. Oh boy, yeah. And I didn't know who he was at the time. Yeah, it tur- turns out he was quite the big deal later. I found the old program and I'm like, that's who that kid was. He turned out to be a decent goalie. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of fun when you start going back and looking at some of the guys you had skated against. Like, huh. Maybe that's why we lost that game. <laughs> yeah. I, in fact, when I was in college, not every school had a JV team. So we would schedule games against junior B teams. And uh, our coach even scheduled a home and home against Shattuck St. Mary's. Yeah. And not thinking much of it at the time. And I've since gone back and looked at the program. And they had this player by the name of Sidney Crosby on their he team. He was okay. He was okay. Yeah. And, you know, Jonathan Taves. And it's like, huh, we, we won both of those games. But I remember my, my one teammate, we, we were at their barn, which is an awesome little barn. And we would get $5 meal money for the ride home. And we're losing to these high school kids by a goal. And the coach goes, if you lose to a bunch of high school kids, you're not getting fries on the way home. <laughs> Well, we, we come back, tie the game, and then my teammate, Grandpa, we called him Grandpa because he had uh, knee reconstructive surgery, so he lost all of his speed. He gets a breakaway and scores. And first of all, we're going, Grandpa, how did you get a breakaway? He goes, I think everybody was back checking so hard, they skated right past me. But he he sits down on the bench and just slams a stick down. And he goes, nobody fucks with my French fries. <laughs> <laughs> he drew the line right there. Yeah, yeah it's like, it, I'm getting my fries on the way home. Uh, so what's, what's the best chirp you've heard on the ice, off the ice, in the locker room? Uh, is it allowed to be off color or not? It sh- sure can. <laughs> we were playing the Islanders and we had a tough guy on our team named Garth Butcher, who was called the Strangler. And the Islanders had a guy named Kenny Baumgartner with big blonde flowing hair. Mm-hmm. And Baumgartner comes into stoppage, cross-checking everybody. And he turns around Garth Butcher and he goes, all right, you want it? You want it? And Butcher looks him right in the eye. And you could hear it through the whole um, island arena. He goes, fight you. I used to fuck girls like you. <laughs> <laughs> and Baumgartner had no answer. He was like, what? And he just turned and skated away. So Butch, Butcher just looked him right in the eye. He goes, fight you. I used to fuck girls like you. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> uh, seeing so you're coaching, I'll share the one that uh, kept – uh, David Hutchins of in goal, uh, shared with me, he goes, his son was at a, uh, camp and his goalie coach looks at him and goes, you must be really good at dodgeball. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, Ooh. you can dodge your wrench. Yeah. It was like, okay. So what's the worst post-game beer you've had? The worst post-game beer? Yeah. Um, there'd be a lot of them. Like I had so many bad games, but it was mostly <laughs> crown Royal that got me into trouble. So there was, there was no singular event. It was every bad loss everything tasted terrible yeah it, it was funny because uh this week at our beer league four of us brought beer uh and four of us brought four different beers and i did not play very good so i looked at the selection and i go what's the worst one that's what i deserved in that. Yeah. <laughs> so you I, tortured yourself yeah ha- had to have myself a budweiser this week uh oh, you, you really must have played bad <laughs> yeah you know it, it was one of those where I, I had covid and so this is my first game back from it and the fatigue set in real early on me that i wasn't expecting so i wound up getting a little lower in my crouch and you know yeah. and um but I, I i had two rebounds that led to goals that uh just poor rebound control that it was like nope that, that we wound up tying the game so at least we didn't lose but i'm going I, I control those two rebounds and we win the game by two. Um, so I was like, nope, my penance is I have to drink a, a Budweiser. <laughs> um, so when you taped your stick, did you go heel to toe or toe to heel? No, no memory. I don't remember. <laughs> that, that's, fair. that's fair. That's fair. I'm, I'm going to guess just because of, uh, you know, when we were playing in our youth, 
that they were wood sticks and the wood sticks had that habit of that heel just kind swelling of swelling up yeah swelling and i think a lot of us because of that we went heel to toe now you mention it yeah heel to toe and the re also too because when you're skating forward the tape will to peel off is easy when you're heel to toe because yep. it's overlapping the correct way yeah, yeah. That makes sense hang on let me check <laughs> yeah, my yeah, my, yeah heel to toe that's the one i used in the nhl <laughs> nice uh so what was your favorite number to wear and why I, I didn't care. Um, I had 31 or 35 when I played in the NHL, depending on what jersey they brought with you in the bag. Um, <laughs> I didn't care. So I didn't care what the number on the back. I cared about the emblem on the front. Yeah, I like that too. That's uh, probably the best answer I've heard. Uh, so the last question, what advice do you have for young goaltenders? My advice would be uh, stop watching hockey, critically study hockey, and Try to learn from as many goalie coaches as you can, not just one, because one guy doesn't have the secret sauce. And subscribe and follow my YouTube channel because I give a free goalie instruction and I don't do it for the money. Uh, we do a video every week and that Future Pro Goalie School YouTube channel has a ton of great info for people. So watch that and reach out to me anytime. Uh, you can have your own NHL goalie coach help you out, no charge. So aside from the YouTube channel, where else can folks find you on social? Uh, Instagram, Future Pro Goalie School, and our webpage is um, Future Pro Goalie School. And um, I've been doing it for over 30 years. And back when we started, there was no private lessons. There was no mentor training. There was no association goalie clinics. None of that had got started yeah. yet. And so I put a bazillion kilometers on my cars back in the day <laughs> to start this type of stuff. So and here you are 30 years later, you know, and in my notes, you know, I had this question in the notes and I apologize for not asking it sooner. So you make it to the NHL as a player. Then you make it back to the NHL as a coach. How rewarding was that as a coach compared to a player making it back to the NHL? Um, I think I was destined to be a coach because I, I think I was a better coach than I was mm -hmm. a player, but um, to effectively make the NHL twice on two different times is a tough thing to pull off, especially because back then most NHL goalie coaches were stars in the NHL. And I had such yeah. a shitty career in the NHL <laughs> to start to the grassroots and go back again and make it on my own merits as a goalie coach. So making the NHL twice is something I consider a feather in my cap. Well, and it, it should be because not, not everybody gets to do it in either the player or the coach side and, and you got to do it on both. So it should be a feather hard work anything can happen exactly it's funny that uh that that message isn't conveyed to kids as much as it should be these days i don't think uh you know i don't think we like to tell kids how hard it is like we want them to feel good and, and it's yep. important to feel good and love hockey but i think we're better served if we're more realistic with kids and say listen play hockey because you love it try to be the best you can and if it makes the nhl great and if it doesn't the legitimate excuse for failure is you did everything possible and it didn't work out. That's fine. Yep. But if you leave some stone unturned, like you didn't do enough, you can't go in the beer league dressing room afterwards and say, Oh, I could have made it if I did this and that nobody gives a shit about that story. What they care about is if you do everything humanly possible and you don't make it, you should be proud of yourself because we can't have 7,000 goalies in the NHL. If it was just a question of doing these 10 things and you're going to make the NHL, everybody be in the NHL. Yep. There's only 32 teams. So my advice to kids is you have to work harder than the people you see and you have to work harder than the people you don't see. Yep. Now you mentioned, you know, every bureau you just got the, the excuse of why they didn't make it. And I don't know if you saw, I think it was over the summer TSN uh, had put out the, the question, you know, what's your excuse for not making it to the NHL? And this one goalie uh, responded, my dad and grandpa combined for 1,300 goals in the NHL, and I decided to be a goalie, and that was Jude Hall, Brett and, Brett's <laughs> son and Bobby Hall's. That's a good answer. <laughs> yeah, and it was like, uh, well, well played. And the funny thing is, I, I was talking to him because he, he grew up, you know, 10 miles from where I live now, uh, and I was talking to him, and his favorite goalie growing up, his favorite player, not just goalie, was Eddie Belfort. <laughs> so uh, I, I was asking Eddie is like so what was it like having uh, you know Brett Hall's kid look up to you and not his dad and he goes oh there, there, there was a certain sense of satisfaction there that whenever oh, yeah. whenever he'd bring him around I, I was extra nice to him just to kind of needle Brett <laughs> oh yeah Eddie's a Eddie's a 
amazing guy. And it was uh, one of the highlight of my coaching careers, being able to coach a Hall of Fame goalie. Yeah. Well, Steve, I've taken up quite a bit of your time. I, I, I put it on our calendars to talk for an hour. and we, We've gone over that. So thank you for being gracious with your time. Uh, we'll, we'll be sure to stay in touch. And uh, if your travels bring you to the Twin Cities, let me know and I'll buy you a beer. A good one. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll, I'll take that up for sure. And um, anything I can do to help out any of your listeners, whether they're beer leaguers or young kids, they can reach out to me at Future Pro on the YouTube channel and I'll, I'll directly help out anybody that asks. No charge. Awesome. Awesome. Well, again, thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. I what an awesome talk conversation with, with Pete. All day. Well, Maybe this is the first time we've ever talked with him. It felt like he can help you with my beer league game. Been like coaching me for years. Maria and Bonzi. He's challenged Steve me to not look the game at the clock in my next beer league game. That's not going to be easy for me. I'm position. not going to lie. I love to try my best. That we shouldn't rely. Be sure to follow Pete on social media. Absorb as much as found on Instagram at goalie underscore mindset. Be sure to follow Twitter at social media. Try underscore mindset. Find him at and search for him on Facebook and YouTube. All one word. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Simply by searching for Wash Up Goalie. Future Pro Goalie on Facebook and Twitter. Visit washupgoalie.com for some great hockey related content. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. My beer league hockey video highlights. And of course, all podcasts. Visit washupgoalie.com for some great hockey related. Content, wash up goalie like or tend to talk video apparel be sure to visit my course, thread the shop all by clicking episodes. the merchandise link on my website if you want some wash up goalie or like this talk podcast apparel, go be listen sure to, to visit my thread the BLPA shop Big by show. clicking the merchandise the link BLPA on my website podcast network show where if a couple like of beer league players talk beer league hockey, hockey Big show. draft experience the shenanigans and exploits from around the game be sure to check out the full lineup of hockey related podcasts on the hockey podcast network as well there are too many lists here but shows like be sure to check out the full lineup of hockey related podcasts on the Hockey Podcast Network the as well. Report co- podcast, there are too many to list and here, but the Sporty like Podcast the can all be and found. Podcast, I need to thank the Ben Zambonis for allowing me to use their music on the In the podcast. Dome Podcast can all you be can found. You can download their music on I iTunes need to thank or the listen where you stream music from. Me to use their music on the podcast. I'm always working on lining up you other goalies. You can download their music on iTunes or listen wherever you stream music from. You are a connection to a goalie who I should talk to. always working on lining up other goalies to talk If you are a goalie or connection to a goalie who I should talk to, Shoot Let's not email. forget, at Wash your brand who wants to sponsor the show, be sure to reach out to me or send me a DM on social media. I'd be happy media. to talk. And Let's not forget, if you like what you hear, be sure to subscribe, be sure to reach rate, out to me. and comment on talk. the podcast platform and you're finally, listening on. If you like what you hear, be sure to subscribe, rate, rate, and comment on the podcast platform you're listening on. Until next time, time keep your stick on the ice and on your body square to the fine tendy talk. Until next time, keep your stick on the ice and your body square to the puck. Hey!